Hi, everybody. It's uh, great to see you all. Um, I'm pleased to introduce uh, Bill Lawrence. Now, I'm sure everybody in this room knows Bill. He's probably, I'd say, arguably the most famous uh, conservation uh, scientist in the world, if, you know, or in the top five. Now, I'm not going to read out his, you know, his academic CV. I think it's give you a few factoids or fun factoids about him. And when he was young, he didn't just want to work in the zoo. He wanted to be the director of a zoo. And you could ask him over a beer why. But I think that's an interesting uh, insight into the man. He didn't want to run, be work at a zoo. He wanted to be the director of a zoo. <laughs> but he, he's had a really fascinating um, uh, uh, long history in um, monitoring, which has really led into some fascinating insights into conservation. He's worked a long time in the Amazon and a long time um, also in Africa and Asia. And those, in those long, long-term long monitoring efforts with PhD students and postdocs have led into some incredible um, findings, which have actually, I think, founded a lot of knowledge, uh, a knowledge that has driven a lot of other research. I know for me, he's working fragmentation effects in the 70s and 80s, really, and, and 90s, really actually forced me to rethink a lot of my stuff in my PhD in the 2000s. You know, he, he founded things like biomass collapse, uh, you know, landscape divergence theory, edge effects. And those are the things that I looked at when I was in Madagascar as a young man. So. He's really been a founding thinker in, in, in ecological theory. But the thing I most admire about Bill is he's a conservationist first and foremost. He really is a man who cares about the outcome. He set up things like Alert, which is about forcing academics to be vocal about their findings around conservation. If you know of his writings recently, there's more and more urgency about actually getting the message out there in amongst the face of, of, of uh, governments and of um, business. And I know firsthand, seeing him in action around the world, um, he is feared by many, many governments and politicians and businesses. He's not liked, which means he's effective. And that's, that's simple. The other thing about Bill I'd just like to tell you about is his service. His service is remarkable. He's been the president of the ATBC, the Association of Tropical Biology. What's ATBC, Sniffleger? Uh, Tropical Biology and Conservation. Yeah, which is the, you know, which is the, the, the sister um, organisation of the SCB. So he's, and he's actually basically driven that organisation for 20 years, you know, really been a founding father. And it's an organisation that I haven't had much to do with, but it's a wonderful organisation. And it's something that I plan to have more to do with in the future. Um, and he's also um, really fostered many, many PhD students and uh, postdocs over the last 30 to 40 years. So if you, you do have a chance to hang out with Bill and talk to him, I really would uh, chat to him about not just the science, but just the, you know, the idea of conservation, the philosophy of conservation. What I like about what you're going to hear now, uh, what I'm delighted to see in his talk, is not, he's not going to reflect on the last 40 years of research. And, you know, the stuff he, you know, he's been publishing a lot about roads recently or, you know, his other stuff. This to me, is an entirely new idea, new set of ideas. So I don't know what he's going to talk about. That, that one I read, that one, brilliant. This is something new, something original. So can't wait to hear it. Thanks, Bill. Oh, thank you, James. That was a, I feel like I should applaud for this. It was, it was a fantastic, that's one of the nicest introductions I've ever had. Do I want to tell you why I want to be the director of the zoo? I, I worked seven summers in different, four different zoos and, and I was the bottom of the totem pole. And mostly what I did was spray poo out of animal cages and things like that. So that's why I wanted to be the director of the zoo. I could tell other people to go clean the cages. So it's really nice to be here. And I think you guys are feeling a little bit like we are at JCU. It's just like, ah, it's almost like the spring of, uh, you know, things are opening up. And oh, thank God these crazy floods are out of the way. Oh, so that was nuts. Um, so it's really nice to see things sort of, I guess, stabilizing here a little bit and, 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 and opening up and hopefully getting back to some of the traditional ways that we used to do things. We would love to do that. Um, so, uh, really thank you to Dan and to Kate, uh, for helping to organize all this. And also of course to James, um, you know, we just, we just said we, we had all kinds of problems with the, it's not working. All right, so that's the first one. Okay, great. All right, so I've given this talk a couple times. I gave it uh, most recently at JCU, and I was a little unhappy with the reaction. I mean, so many people said, "Oh, it's pretty interesting and all that," but ah, oh, it was so depressing. And I, that's not what I want to do. You know, that's not what we want to do. We want to empower people and activate people and that type of thing. 
Uh, so I'm just giving you a little bit of a forewarning that this is kind of depressing, some of this stuff, and, and it just is. And there's not too much you can do about it when you're talking about some of these fairly harsh uh, realities other than perhaps take a few deep breaths, maybe try to find a beer or something like that, at least afterwards, and hopefully all join together. Now, as you well know, humans are changing the planet in an incredible myriad ways uh, simultaneously. We're disrupting and fragmenting and, and, and altering habitats. We're changing fire regimes, climate change, of course, roads, as, as James mentioned, hunting activities, exotic pathogens, and a whole suite of other kinds of environmental changes. This is the world and this is the reality that we are living in right now, that there's a lot of environmental change, different kinds of environmental change um, happening. And this is leading to a lot of, frankly, scary trends. Uh, for instance, the paper James led 2016 found that global wilderness areas in just a relatively brief period of time there, just uh, 15 years or so, 16 years, um, had shrunk by a tenth. I mean, that's a really rapid rate of decline and has already had been very substantially reduced by then. Um, I was a part of this group here, the collapsing core forest, where we calculated how much of the world's forests were within one kilometer of forest edge, where you could get edge effects and other kinds of changes, and we found about 70%. So most of the forest now, you know, two thirds of the forest, three quarters of the forest are fragmented or disrupted in some way in which there's lots of forest edges around. Uh, this is work led by one of my postdocs, Sean Sloan. Um, we found that um, half of the biodiversity hotspots, we thought this was bad. We actually went in with a rigorous or robust remote sensing approach, and we found that half of hotspots, biodiversity hotspots, have just three to 10% of their original vegetation remaining that's in any kind of intact state at all. And we had, we had a very liberal definition of uh, what pristine was. So, so really, that's a kind of a scary number. Um, this is a modeling, the Taubert et al. study is a modeling study in which they looked at how tropical forests are changing as a result of prevailing trends. And what they basically found is that almost all the world's tropical areas are, what we're ending up with are systems that are much more fragmented, have many, many more fragments, many more small fragments, and that the whole size distributions of fragments are shifting into smaller sizes. And it's a very strong trend statistically. So that's why that was published in Nature. And then, of course, the human footprint. This is work led by Oscar Venner when he was a postdoc in my lab. And of course, Oscar got his PhD here in affiliation with you guys uh, and just looked at the human footprint and, and found <coughs> excuse me, that the tropics and arable lands were declining <coughs> the fastest. <coughs> Pardon me. Now, um, I want to talk about the environmental synergisms right now. I've actually listed this as environmental synergies. I had a paper I submitted and a person who was British was rather snooty and he said, oh, and I'm, I'm, by the way, I'm more Australian than I am American anymore, but he said, you Americans always have to make up new words, environmental synergisms, it should be environmental synergies. I don't know where the guy got that attitude. He's like, the British guy acts like he invented the English language. Um, anyway, so a typical traditional definition of an environmental synergism, and there's certain fields of science where these have been studied, are things like environmental toxicology. And people might find, you know, compound A causes a certain amount of distress and mortality in, in a species of fish, let's say. Compound B causes some more. But when you have the two together, it causes even more than that. There's an amplification effect. And there's just an example here. Ruben et al., very recent paper, found that microplastics, which, of course, all the plastics that we're dumping into the seas and other places, are oftentimes ending up as microplastics. They break down to a certain degree. Um, and then they very oftentimes get uh, infiltrated uh, with organic compounds and other kinds of toxins. And they found that with various kinds of pollutants, including uh, pesticides, that they're getting about a tenfold, up to a tenfold increase in lethality. So that's the traditional way that people talked about synergisms. That's just a, an art piece there that one of our artists, that's on the Cairns campus there. So we have this plastic embryo. I, I find it a little, I don't know, it's a bit much, but anyway. That's bigger than you think. So it's over, over five meters wide. And, that, and to make that, uh, Robin Wright um, you know, collected a thousand plastic bottles from the Great Barrier Reef. Okay, so that's the, what I just mentioned is the traditional definition. We've tended to use, or I've tended to use, a sort of a more simple and relaxed definition because you know, those technical kinds of um, highly specified studies 
they're dealing with systems in which you can really precisely, you can manipulate the system and you can precisely change concentrations of different compounds. Dealing with some of the real world landscapes that we talk about in regions, um, you just can't do that. So we've had a much sort of simpler idea is that basically what we're calling a synergism is just if two things are happening and if something bad results from it, that that's a synergism, okay? And so I've just sort of called this the environmental splat uh, thing. So, so basically, now, when, because of that issue, I actually thought we would have problem publishing some of our work. And in fact, we haven't found that at all. We've just used this loose, relaxed definition of synergisms, and it hasn't been pro a problem at all uh, to publish in various journals. So what I'm going to do is talk about, I think, four environmental synergisms, partly in response to my friends and colleagues in Cairns who said that the talk was highly depressing. I've actually reduced this by about a third. So you should be a third less uh, depressed at the end. We shall see. OK, this is. Um, I have to talk about roads, of course, and hunting often goes hand in hand with roads. This chap right here, by the way, this is in uh, Republic of Congo. We ran into him. It was a newly constructed Chinese funded road right through one of the largest national parks in the Southern Republic of Congo. And here was this guy in there hunting. And what he was doing, those are mustache monkeys. And he was shooting them and then selling them to drivers as they go by for bushmeat. And it's just, you know, that was something we got, we got out. We, I thought also, by the way, have a look at his shirt. The shirt says Chinese Congo friendship, I guess. So anyway, we got out and we talked to him a little bit. And I, I, I thought about maybe trying to buy the monkeys from him. And I offered him a really low price. Um, and then he just basically, I was just kind of trying to be a little bit obnoxious and because and, I wasn't too impressed with what he was doing. Very much poaching. So that's uh, a big critical environmental synergism. One of the reasons for that is we are in the most rapid and dramatic era of expansion, transportation infrastructure in human history. So roads, highways, railroads, all kinds of different linear infrastructure is increasing dramatically. Paved roads, just paved roads, are projected to increase by about 25 million kilometers uh, by the middle part of the century, according to the respected group, International uh, Energy Agency. So, and that's enough to go around the world more than 600 times. So we are living in this incredible era of road expansion. And as I look around the room and see different people here, I know some people are living in countries where there's amazing amounts of proliferation of road activity right now. And another thing that's interacting with the roads is that there's been a fundamental change, as you, as you well know, in hunting technologies. So instead of traditional spears and bows and arrows and darts and things like that, and, and snares made out of uh, vines, now what you see, and I don't know how many people, how many people have been to Central Africa? Yeah, you've been, okay. Well, one thing you see is a lot of automatic weapons. You know that, like you really see lots of people with automatic weapons. So that's really proliferated there. The snares here, you can see wire, wire and cable snares are just ubiquitous now in much of the developing world because cable and wire is just so cheap. It's just found everywhere. And so this, by the way, is the result of, I think it was two or three hours of searching within a Cambodian protected area, sorry. This, oops, now what have I done? How do I help? Sorry. Um, Need to click on it. Okay. So anyway, that was a result of two or three hours of searching within a national park in Cambodia. That's the snares that they cleared uh, there. And one of the things that you're seeing, and, and people like Matt, who are doing a lot of camera trapping, uh, Matt, you must have picked this up, is we're not just seeing, snares are not just killing a lot of wildlife, they're maiming a lot of wildlife. I mean, this is the thing you're seeing, animals with these terrible uh, you know, scars on their legs and sometimes around their neck, and you see elephants that have had their trunks cut off by, by these snares, things like that. This is a chimpanzee that lost a, an arm. Pretty intelligent animal. I imagine it didn't, I'd be interested to know what the chimpanzee is thinking about all that. Anyway, so just as an example of this sort of carry on this idea of the synergism between roads and, and hunting, this is the Congo Basin, of course. And as you all know, it's the second largest area of tropical rainforest in the world. I grew up thinking of this as like one of the world's great wild areas, reading things like Joseph Conrad's Heart of Darkness and things like that. But if you look at the Congo today, 
what you see is that there's in fact a lot of roads there. If it's a wilderness, if they're very heavily eroded wilderness, and even if you zoom in in places like that, where it doesn't appear that there's many roads and you use high resolution methods, what you see is in fact, there's a lot of smaller logging roads ramifying all through the forest. So this was a very interesting study that was done by James Blake, a large scale study with lots of people involved. And what they've done here is they've looked in uh, across equatorial Africa and they've looked at the distances from major roads and they've measured both elephant densities and, and human signs. So, <coughs> excuse me. So as you can see here, as you get closer and closer to roads, maybe, I don't know, 15 to 20 kilometers, you're getting this big increase in hunting activity. And this would be based on things like hunting camps, machete marks, shotgun shells, footprint, boot prints, things like that. So the signs that poachers leave. So you see that big increase near roads. And then look at what's happening to the elephant densities here. These are forest elephants. Um, look at that, they're really dropping down roughly and pretty much in, in concert uh, with that. So I think that's a fairly uh, compelling data set there. And what they then did is they looked, they used those spatial data and they laid them on top of the existing road network at the time. And they uh, asked where is suitable habitat where elephants can still survive. Um, places that are free of hunting or with very limited hunting and that are remote enough. And by the way, this is the Northern Republic of Congo right here. You can see here, this is regarded as one of the most important refugial areas for survival of not just elephants, but big wildlife, hunting sensitive wildlife. Well, the Chinese, sorry, I shouldn't be too, but anyway, the Chinese uh, through the Belt and Road Initiative funded a major logging road through here all the way up to the capital of Central African Republic. And that's a massive road. It's not just like a track. It's like a five lane dirt track, very heavily graded and all that. And as soon as that happened, guess what started going on inside a national park there. So this is inside a national park and the, evidently poachers had come in uh, from, from the road and killed the elephant there. We found uh, a skeleton and we're dead certain that it was killed by poachers because we looked at its face and its face had been chopped off. The, the poachers shoot the elephant or, or snare it and then they chop off the front of the face in order to extract the, the ivory uh, trunk, uh, tusks, which of course are very valuable. So roads really do seem to have a, a tremendous um, important and pretty stunning impact. Okay, a second synergism. Deforestation disrupts rainfall, so, or precipitation more broadly. Um, yeah, I think one of the conclusions coming out of a lot of work is that when you're getting changes in forest cover, disruption of forests, you're very often changing the physical land surface in substantial ways that's having, can have a variety of uh, <coughs> different kinds of effects. So I want to mention a very interesting <coughs> concept here by Ronnie Avatar at Duke. And um, what Ronnie has argued and hypothesized, and I think that there's an increasing amount of both uh, empirical and also theoretical modeling evidence to support it, Here's what he says. Oh, sorry. Um, if you, the, here's some, the, the yellow line we can see is a, is a linear decline in rainfall as deforestation increases. Now, the reason, of course, that would, could occur, I think, as everybody knows, is forests give off um, a lot of evapotranspiration. They give off a lot of water vapor, and that water vapor is really important in terms of maintaining cloud cover and therefore reflecting a lot of heat back into outer space from these very high equatorial regions. And also uh, in terms of maintaining dry season rainfall. So these are areas where you don't have synoptic changes. Um, you just have the inherent vapor coming off of the forest. And that's crucial for helping forests to survive the dry season and not burn. And they, get very, they can get very vulnerable to burning. Anyway, Ronnie said this, he said, look, he doesn't believe that there's a linear decline in, in rainfall as you, as you deforest. He also doesn't believe that like this blue line here that you get a sudden collapse in rainfall and then, and then it levels out. What he argues, what he argues is that what you'd actually get as habitat fragmentation proceeds, you'll actually get an increase in rainfall. And then at some point, at some threshold, i.e. like a point, you're gonna get a rapid collapse in rainfall. 
And the mechanisms behind this are pretty interesting. If we look at a fragmented landscape here, so what I've got is a couple of patches of forest and with a large clearing like a cattle pasture in the middle. That cattle pasture gets very hot and dry. Because it's hot and dry, it radiates a lot of heat up into the air and it warms up the atmosphere. When the atmosphere is warmed, of course, it becomes less dense and it rises, okay? So you basically created a vacuum or kind of a vacuum over that clearing, right? Because the, the, the uh, air is moving upward. Well, what that does actually is it creates a kind of suction pump that starts drawing the moisture, it starts drawing the air in from the surrounding forest, which is much more laden with moisture. It's much more, uh, much higher humidity. And then what tends to happen, you have that high pressure zone that sucks up a lot of this moist air from the forest that then rises and then you eventually get convectional thunderstorms. Actually, I shouldn't say uh, eventually, they can happen very rapidly and they tend to happen quite regularly. You get convectional thunderstorms. The rain actually falls over the forest, over the clearing, not over the rainforest typically, and then recycles back over the rainforest's drier air. So the bottom line is this, when you fragment the forest, you're creating, according to Ronnie Avasar's worldview, this sort of dynamic cycle of suction that's basically robbing uh, the forest of moisture. And this is some work that my uh, Briant et al. Um, did. And this is, they, they looked at, we actually were involved in this, um, but what they did was they looked at canopy desiccation, use this modus imagery to, to develop a shortwave infrared water stress index. This right here, this right here um, is the forest edge, okay? Right there would be a forest edge. And this is going further and further into the forest interior, up to eight kilometers here. Well, when they actually looked at this water stress index, and a negative value means more, more water stress, um, what they found was that essentially up to almost three kilometers into the forest, you're getting a perceptible, measurable decline in canopy moisture. In other words, the forest is getting dried out, and it's getting dried out because it's fragmented, even at large scales. Three kilometers? How many forest areas in Australia could you go into the forest three kilometers and still be, you know, still be um, far away from uh, areas of degradation, that type of thing. So anyway, um, this is the, one of the mechanisms or the key mechanisms that seem to be driving this dynamic. So if you fragment a forest, not only are you changing all those biodiversity things that we're used to talking about, such as you know, bio, island biogeography theory and that type of thing, but there's also very likely to be a whole suite of physical changes that alter the moisture and the dynamics and, and other things in tropical forests. And as you know, if you don't have rain, you're not gonna really have a rainforest. So that's pretty important. Now, a related idea, our third synergism here is habitat fragmentation and fire. Um, what you see in many areas, this is work done in the Amazon. This just shows a couple of, uh, shows it. I might suggest that some kind of pointer system would be useful. Okay, um, so anyway, uh, we did try that before. So. Anyway, here's a couple of landscapes. Um, this is one fragmented landscape there. There's a different fragmented landscape there. Typical kind of patterns that you can get in the, um, in the Amazon. Um, one of the patterns that you see very strongly is that, that the cattle pastures that surround a lot of these fragmented habitats um, are burned almost every year. The ranchers burn the grass because they want to kill weeds and they want to produce a flush of green grass, which the cattle like. The problem is the forest, the fragmented forests Firstly, the canopy tends to thin out because the surrounding uh, uh, microclimate is, is drier. So the forests are stressed. You also get a lot of litter fall and branches and other kinds of things on the forest floor. So you get more fuel that can burn. And so these fires don't just stop at the forest edge. They oftentimes keep going. And that's, we were very interested in that phenomenon because fire is such a foreign disturbance to rainforests and um, uh, is really can be, really quite devastating. This is an example here of a surface fire. So that's, um, you can see there's quite a lot of uh, leaf litter in the understory, very dry flammable leaf litter. And then you get these surface fires um, moving through the forest. 
And we were interested to know, like, what's the spatial scale of, the, of these surface fires? So this is about data from about 1,400 forest fragments of varying sizes. And what we calculated here was their fire frequency as a function of distance to forest edge. And so the data for a whole bunch of forest fragments have all been combined here in just one simple function. Uh, but you, know, you don't have to look at this very hard, hard to see, like you hardly ever get fires deep into the forest. But then as you get maybe within two, three kilometers, you start getting more. And then suddenly kaboom, at maybe 800, 1,000 meters, you really get an exponent, almost an exponential uh, increase. So the bottom line is these surface fires can really be destructive to landscapes. And you see these landscapes when you're driving around in the Amazon. Um, you'll see sometimes a little patch of rainforest that's still surviving, but it'll be surrounded by all these dead trees. And they tend to get bleached and get kind of white, and they call this ghost forest or ghost trees. And it's a very common pattern is these ghost trees, ghost forest uh, surrounding the forest fragments. So as the fragments are collapsing over time, because the remote sensing imagery shows us that, is that most of the fragments are essentially losing this war with fire and they're collapsing. And it's a, it's a phenomenon that can be very powerful. Now, um, I want to mention just quickly, I think something that we, we all know is that there's a lot of concern about how climate change might alter uh, climate and, and weather variables and other kinds of environmental changes, such as the forest disruption that we're talking about. Um, one thing to bear in mind is just three, three ideas, ideas here. Big areas of the tropics are already close to their physiological limits. This is something that some people don't necessarily understand is that there's actually a lot of rainforest areas that are just kind of on the margins of their distribution. They're, they're doing okay. But when you start fragmenting and altering um, the forests, you get the kind of changes that we've been talking about. You get less evapotranspiration coming off the forest because you have less forest. That causes drought, localized droughts. That, that increases the likelihood of fire. Um, the fires generate a lot of smoke. And it turns out that the smoke from these fires, this is something people are increasingly aware of, is that the smoke from the fires actually create massive rain shadows downwind. So if you look at the major biomass burning centers in the Amazon, um, what you'll see is that there's smoke plumes that go thousands of kilometers all the way to the Andes and then right down into around Sao Paulo and Rio, those places down in the south. Um, so and the reason that that happens is that the smoke hypersaturates the atmosphere with cloud condensation nuclei, which are little teeny particles that the water droplets bind with and then, uh, then become coalesce and become big enough to become raindrops. Well, this just carries all those water molecules away via the heat and via those, those small particles and creates a downwind drought. So there's this exacerbation of things going on, multiplication of threats. And then the other thing is, wow, the numbers of ignition sources now are just, I mean, traditional fires in a place like the Amazon would have been really rare. Um, and, uh, you know, I mean, prior to, prior to human arrivals, say for instance, now typically, you could get probably 60, 70, 80,000 major fire events in the Amazon every year. So that's no, no exaggeration. So one of the concerns about all this is that, look, if all these changes are happening, if all this disruption is happening, could we see a loss of resilience? Resilience, of course, being the capacity of the ecosystem to bounce back after it's been disturbed. And there is, uh, this paper just came out, and I thought it was really nice. Um, this group, Bolton et al., um, concluded that more than three quarters of the Amazon is losing resilience. And they had a, a variety of techniques. I'm not really familiar with all these different statistical techniques that they use, but there's a various tricks that they use. And it, boy, it was a really data-rich paper, so I thought it was good. So by force disruption and climate change, the Amazon is moving potentially closer to a large-scale dieback. And they found that resilience is de declining fastest in the somewhat drier areas and also areas closer to human activity. And you can see on this little figure here that um, the uh, areas in red or pink are areas that are losing resilience and areas in blue are uh, increasing resilience with there's not very many areas in blue. Okay, so hopefully we're all still okay. I don't see anybody looking imminently suicidal, so. So 
The last one I'd like to talk about, last synergism I thought I'd mention is we have to talk about pathogens, of course, and, and emerging diseases. So um, there, we're, we're living in a world which is becoming warmer and in which uh, rainfall regimes, precipitation regimes are changing. I wouldn't say they're increasing, they might be to a degree, but it's complex, it depends where you are. And it depends you know, a lot on the climate systems and circulations. So anyway, um, warming is likely because it, in the world that we're living in, it's gonna get warmer, in some cases wetter, and that's broadly better for pathogens, most, many pathogens. A good example of one of these kinds of pathogens, of course, is the famous chytrid, infamous chytrid fungus. This is some work that we did on this uh, up in North Queensland. And you can see, I might just, this would be slightly easier, wouldn't it, if I just should, have done, should just be doing it this way. You, what you can see here, we were monitoring four species of frogs, a couple of them which are really quite common. That's, that's the number of in, individuals detected in a 100 meter transect along the stream. But look at what happened to their populations when the chytrid showed up. At the time, we didn't know it was a chytrid, we just knew it was something bad was coming, and almost certainly a pathogen. But anyway, boom, 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 gone. One of them clinging on. So really nasty thing. Um, global pathogen probably caused at least 200 extinctions of amphibians so far. And Alan Pounds published this paper in 2006. And it's interesting. Um, he argued that the chytrid-driven extinctions of harlequin frogs. So harlequin frogs are mostly found in high elevation areas in the Andes. And there basically wasn't... Uh, there was an ecological Armageddon as a consequence of these chytrids. Almost all of the harlequin frogs have been wiped out. It's just a few species hanging around now. So anyway, but what he argued is that this was mostly happening in warmer years. And it was consistent, they argued, because they knew that that fungal pathogen liked certain, a certain temperature range. And these things were up at high elevations where it was quite cool. So I said, warmer years, it'll, you'll get more in the growth range of that fungus. And that's when you should expect to see the extinctions. And they seem to have good evidence for it. I didn't believe it at all. I really didn't. And I set out to basically look at the Australian frog data that we'd work on and see what happened there. And lo and behold, son of a gun, I don't know how many of you still believe in p-values. We got a p of 0.045 in favor of Pound's hypothesis. I don't know what to say other than it seems to be consistent with the idea that there can be a link between weather variables and uh, pathogen deadliness, something like that. Okay. And of course, well, we live in an era of emerging pathogens. Many locally endemic or restricted pathogens are becoming global pathogens. I mean, that's probably the, you know, and it's happening so rapidly. Um, so, uh, and, and lots of the kinds of species that we tend to deal with, by the way, pangolins, uh, civets, bats, um, can be potential carriers of things. So one thing I wanted to ask here, sort of as we're closing in at the end, are these synergisms actually hurting biodiversity? That's an important question to ask. Are they really hurting biodiversity or is it just kind of messing everything up? And us as ecologists, we're not very happy with it because we like pristine, lovely places. Um, in fact, I would argue that uh, it probably is really important for biodiversity. Firstly, I would argue quite strongly, I think most species are facing multiple threats. Oftentimes when we're doing our science, we don't necessarily uh, address more than one threat uh, at once. But if you just look at the different kinds of data sets out there, including the IUCN red data sets, this is, this is just one example. This is work that Carlos Perez, a uh, Brazilian ecologist, um, did in the Amazon. And they had about 150 habitat fragments and he scored logging intensity and burning intense, or hunting, excuse me, hunting intensity in every one of those 150 fragments. And what they found, you can see here, um, sorry, no, no logging, light, moderate, high, very high. Well, look how many of those fragments have got moderate to high to very high hunting activity, excuse me, logging activity, the same thing with hunting. So they're not just being fragmented, their habitat quality is diminishing and they're being probably uh, threatened in other ways. So we did an analysis in published 2009 and that we asked explicitly using available data from the IUCN red data base, if you look at species that have two or more threats, according to the experts on that species, they said, look, that species is prone to fires and logging and hunting, let's say for instance. 
So we looked at the pairs of combinations and what we, we generated, I, I can explain later if someone wants, it's a very simple way of generating expected values. And then we actually looked at the actual incidence of species that were harmed by that synergism. So for instance, agriculture and hunting turned out to be the most important. The expected value was here, which would have been about what, 3%, 2%, and then look at what we actually observed. And this, I've only showed a few of these synergisms right here. There's a whole big list of them. And we looked at mammals, birds, and amphibians. And every single group was just kind of off the charts in terms of statistical significance and all that. So that's a strong pattern. To me, that suggests that species are succumbing very often to combinations of environmental threats. So for instance, the orangutan, of course, is having rapid habitat destruction in much of its geographic range in Southeast Asia. And also there's hunting and other kinds of persecution. And you add those kinds of things together and you can really talk about an important threat to species survival. So some take home messages. I would argue that environmental synergisms are probably common in nature. I don't think we think about them enough. I don't think we talk about them enough. Um, synergistic drivers, I think, can greatly complicate um, our efforts to try to predict the results of the human activity. That's one of the real challenges. Um, because of their cryptic nature and their uncertain action, their high te spatial temporal variability, all those things are going to make it hard sometimes, many times, to try to do, to try to necessarily see simple patterns, but still it's important. And I think, I think finally, the, the key conclusion I would say is this, look, if we think the world is being assaulted by, the natural world is being assaulted by a lot of environmental synergisms, that we really need to err on the side of being careful, being cautious being of the precautionary principle when we make conservation recommendations. And I think sometimes we can voice and highlight some of these synergisms in their inherent uncertainties when we're dealing with decision makers and with others like that. So I think that it's a time well spent investing a time to, to think about this. I've been talking about tropical forests. I just wanted to mention in closing that, you know, you don't have to think very far or very hard to realize there's lots of systems that are gonna be affected by this. So heat waves in the Great Barrier Reef, uh, nutrient levels from sedimentation, a lot of mostly off of agricultural lands and also sedimentation. So potential synergism happening there. I'll bet some kinds of things are being affected by those combinations of factors, but I'm not sure if anyone's ever actually looked at this. Okay. We made it. Thank you very much. I really appreciate your interest and time and happy to answer a few questions. Thank you.